All right, we'll start. Hello, my name is Sharon Roberson, President and CEO of the YWCA Nashville in Middle Tennessee. The mission of the YWCA is eliminating racism, empowering women, promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. Today is part of a series, our Stand Against Injustice Lunch and Learn series. Today's topic is Second Amendment in our communities, and we are very excited. The Second Amendment is the basis for uh, the argument that individuals have the right to bear arms. We're going to talk about that from a historical and legal perspective, but also we're going to look at the impact of this, uh, I guess, debate on our community, both as a city and really at the grassroots level. I'm going to start off by reading a quote. Guns are the leading cause of death for anyone under the age of 19. That never been, that's never been seen before in any country in history. It's an issue that's growing, it's before us, and now is the time for us all to act. That is a quote from former Senator Bill Frisk. He was a senator and used to be the uh, leading, the senior senator from the state of Tennessee. And when you have partners like Bill Frisk and individuals in our community coming together in a bipartisan way to solve this issue, it's very important that we at the YW educate you on this issue. As we say at the YW, we invite you into the conversation. We do not indict individuals. We want you to learn as much as possible. And I am thrilled at the panel that we have assembled to really dig deep into this topic as much as we can, let's say in an hour. So we're very excited. I want to ask each of our panelists to, to do a brief introduction of themselves. And I'll start with you, Professor Jake Charles. Sure. Well, uh, thank you, Sharon. I'm really happy and honored to be here with Ron and Clemmy. Uh, thanks to the YM YWCA for the invitation. Um, I'm Jake Charles. I'm a professor of law at Pepperdine University Caruso School of Law. I'm also an affiliated scholar with the Duke Center for Firearms Law at Duke University School of Law. And my research and writing is all about firearms law and the Second Amendment. I'm excited for this conversation today. All right, thank you. All right, Ron Johnson, please introduce yourself. Hey, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sharon, for hearing me and Jake and, and Clemmy. It's an honor to be on this call with you. My name is Ron Johnson. I am the Director of Safety here in Mayor John Cooper's office, appointed about two and a half years ago, working to try and find innovative and creative ways to bring our community together, different from in the past. All right, Ms. Clement Greenlee. Good afternoon. I am honored to be here uh, with all the queens and the kings. Let me just say that with the mastermind, because we are what we are. Uh, I am the founder of Natural Peacemakers. Under that organization is a program I have formulated by, not by choice, but by force, called mm -hmm. Mothers Over Murder. All right, well, thank you. And I want to thank the Nissan Foundation and Alliance Bernstein for making this webinar uh, possible and free. This conversation we hope will build community, spark dialogue and build a consciousness of legacies of discrimination and oppression. We are extremely uh, grateful because Nissan Foundation has stayed with us and they're continuing to fund this initiative in our next fiscal year. Uh, I want to start off with the Second Amendment because really the language is very short. However, it has led to much debate and what it actually means, especially from a historical perspective. And it reads, a well-regulated militia being comma, being necessary to the security of a free state comma. The reason I read the commas is because they're very important in interpretation of this language. The right of the people to keep and bear arms comma, shall not be infringed. Now, over the last 50 years, the Second Amendment has become central to what I see as a culture war with deeply partisan interpretations over what these words really mean and what these words are supposed to protect. This spring, America's long history of gun violence uh, came home to Nashville, unfortunately. On March 27th, three children and three nine-year-olds were killed at the Covenant School by a former student. 
On May 30th, a four-year-old girl was killed in the backseat of a car when two men shot more than 20 rounds into the vehicle. The Covenant shooting was kind of interesting. I had worked on a panel for two and a half years at the mayor's office, looking specifically at gun violence and violence in the community. And I found it interesting that so many people were so surprised at this happening in Nashville. And I guess that's against the backdrop of really understanding the data that shows the level of gun violence in our city and in our state. Our governor, Governor Bill Lee, has called a special session of the Tennessee General Assembly to be held in August. That is, quote, will strengthen public safety and preserve constitutional rights. Now, we have a lot of varying laws and things like that in the state of Tennessee and actually we moved in the opposite direction to restrictions of guns. We've actually loosened the requirements. Uh, on the other hand, our gun control advocates are out in full force and want stronger reform, and that's a very bipartisan group. The YWC in Nashville, Middle Tennessee promotes trauma-informed survivor center policies and practices and youth empowerment efforts. And we do this because we really want to make sure people have the right, as they should, to have a just and safe community. So let's get started. Uh, Professor Charles, one of our goals today is to build legal literacy. What can you tell us about important cases on the Second Amendment and how that affects our issues for gun control? All right. Well, I will try not to give a full law school lecture here, even though I've taught an entire <laughs> semester's worth of material on this very question. Uh, I'll focus on, on three important Supreme Court cases. But first, as a bit of background, I think it's important to recognize that the Second Amendment was ratified in 1791, along with the other first 10 amendments to the Constitution as the Bill of Rights. And for the first 217 years of our national existence, the Second Amendment was basically legally dead. It didn't invalidate any laws. The Supreme Court never said that it applied to an individual right unconnected to malicious service. As you heard from Sharon, it has a militia clause at the beginning. And it wasn't until 2008 in a case called District of Columbia versus Heller that the Supreme Court first said the Second Amendment applies to individuals for using guns in personal self-defense apart from service in a well-regulated militia. So that 2008 decision was kind of a watershed decision in constitutional law. It changed the landscape of what legal challenges would look like in court going forward after that. Two years later, the Supreme Court had another decision um, about a handgun ban in the city of Chicago called McDonald versus City of Chicago. And there the Supreme Court said the Second Amendment not only restricts the National Congress from enacting certain types of gun laws, but also restricts the states and local governments too. And then just last summer in 2002, the Supreme Court in a case called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association against Bruin had its third of three major Second Amendment cases. And the most recent decision was about a restrictive handgun carry license that New York State maintained. The Supreme Court said it's unconstitutional to have that restrictive of a regime. That regime required a person to show proper cause before they could get a handgun permit. And the Supreme Court said the Constitution does not allow govern government officials to have that kind of discretion over constitutional rights. But more significantly, that decision last summer also changed the method for how lower courts should evaluate and assess new Second Amendment claims. So now when a person comes into court and says, this, red, this uh, restriction violates my Second Amendment rights, the courts can only look to history and tradition to judge whether that's constitutional. In Bruin, the Supreme Court said, unless a law has an analog in American history, sometime close uh, to the founding era, then that law is unconstitutional today. And what that means is that innovative or, uh, or novel types of firearms regulation are probably going to be off the table unless the government can convince courts that those have some kind of analog in our distant past. Uh, it's important, I think, also to recognize that's different from how the courts have traditionally analyzed other constitutional rights, like free speech rights, for instance, where the courts will look at contemporary evidence of whether or not the law is serving the interest that the state is trying to meet in enacting that law. So those are kind of the three big cases out of the Supreme Court and the lower courts have heard a lot more cases since then, but that structures the course of what the gun debate looks like when we're talking about constitutional restrictions. 
So in essence, what you're saying is going into the future based on the most recent Supreme Court case, it will be even more difficult to limit uh, the uh, proliferation of guns in our community. I think that's right. I think that's right. Although there, there, there is a robust history of gun regulation throughout American history. It's kind of um, thought that most gun regulation is modern, but there is a robust history. Um, and all of all, all of the questions essentially turn on how closely related those old laws are to new laws. So there is an argument that some of the new laws are actually related closely to these old laws. But you're right that most people are reading the decision to mean that states are going to have less authority to enact laws afterward. Yeah. All right. Well, over the past three years, Tennessee has significantly expanded gun rights. And I guess even before this was the law, uh, what are some of the reasons for this trend to, of loosening gun laws in the state and the nation? Let me go to you, Ron. Why do you believe that there's this trend in loosening uh, gun laws? Well, in, in a state like Tennessee, in loosening, I would just say when, when you think about loosening gun laws, it's not really, it's particularly for a particular group of people, uh, I would say, because, you know, in, in, in the African-American community, that's not a thing that we hear uh, much of where people own guns in a sense legally for the most part, especially in the area where I work, uh, as far as working with young people and a young adult. Uh, rarely have I run across a young adult to say, I got a gun legally for the most part. Uh, but most of the time when you run across someone that has a gun legally, these are more people uh, that are hunters. But what we have in our state is, you know, people who are making these draconian laws, uh, you know, specifically for them and for, uh, you know, uh, you know, people who who hunt and really, to me, I think, uh, who like to use um that stand your ground law. I don't even know if we have it here, but they want to use that in a sense uh, to say, this is why I need these guns because of all the violence that's happening. And what we find is, is violence begins violence and most of the violence are all proximity. You know, you don't have violence in the sense of where, it, you know, if it's a black crime, it's usually going to be a black person on black person crime and that's proximity. Uh, and if it's a crime that someone white may have committed, it's going to be a crime where someone white have committed against someone white. So I think those laws that we have in our state are based on race, you know, really and truly. It's based on race. Um, and it's not a whole lot we can do about it other than we need to vote and we need to make absolutely sure that we get those people out and then demand some of the changes that we would like to see. I'm hoping that this, this, uh, this meeting coming up next month that the governor is going to have, we start seeing some changes. That's my hope. But um, the jury is still out. Okay. And Clement, you're saying we've expanded uh, really gun rights and made it easier to have guns in the community. What do you see that the effect of that? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, people who know me know I don't have any political speech. I just have street speech. So I'm, I'm really falling behind Ron because he, he was really getting ready to touch on it. Uh, <clears throat> I was just telling uh, this pastor last night that in one week in my Mothers Over Murder group, I went from three to 15, from 15 to 21, from 21 to 45. And now I went from 45 to almost 53 in one week. So I had to go buy some more chairs to add to my mom's group. And I don't like that. So when I see another about, another mother call me on my phone about her son getting murdered last night, night for last, night for last, I wonder why we don't talk about that. Because even though I was up on the Covenant shooting, I was up on the four-year-old shooting, I've been up on all the shootings, but I don't hear about them. And I, I got really disturbed the difference between the Covenant shooting and that four-year-old shooting because the Covenant shooting was all over the network. The four-year-old shooting, I don't, if I hadn't really just start fussing about it, probably wouldn't even got recognized. I even set up a memorial service for her. And four hours later, I went by there and it was just still my same two teddy bears. So I, I it, it broke my heart, but it also made me think, you know, what is the difference between a bullet and the gun, the color of a person? What is the difference? So until we come together, everybody, 
come together and change this law, this Second Amendment, when, when he say it was 1791, oh, you know that there's been time to change some language in that. And until we stand up and change this language, until we stand up and tell Governor Lee that it's people like us, not them, not those, not they, it's people like me and the uh, local community that's going to be able to control this gun violence and the gun use out here. I know we can do it, and we've been done it before. And I feel like that's mean we don't get money like I would like to have to show them. I remember when I used to talk to Mayor Briley. I called Dean. All of, I mean, I can name all these mayors. That's mean I don't want to hit nothing nobody got to say no more because I'm sitting here 20 years later with the same conversation, and that's irritating. But I remember I said, give me $50,000, 90 days, and get out of my way, and let me show you how I can change this one community over here where I live at. And nobody never called me on my bluff. And we sit here today with over, I'm not only with over all of these murders, but I'm looking at these guns I just saw on here, the stat on here with guns, 621 guns stolen out of a car just in our neighborhood in Nashville. And if y'all don't think nothing wrong with that, and then your four lane, we had what, 1,500? And so we still talking about it. And then we had 400 and something. Now we up to 621. So to me, it's a setup because I feel like why they don't get a penalty. I don't say nobody need to be locked up, but I think they need to be fine, real healthy. And, and they'll stop doing it. And the other thing that I put on my Facebook page probably cost me to go to jail on my Facebook book. If anybody in my family ever get killed, by one of those guns that was stolen out of your car, I'm charging you with murder also. So maybe that'll give them something to think about. All right, well, Professor Charles, we have the expansion of, of, of gun rights. Is there any legal significance or anything in your research that you have seen that offers a trend or the basis for this trend? Yeah, so <clears throat> I've looked at uh, kind of some national trends in gun expansions and, um, I actually talked about the ways in which the Second Amendment, even though it is a, a kind of a bedrock and a foundation that is a floor that stops some amount of gun regulations, it's actually not the most important legal impediment to gun laws. Uh, there are lots of expansions happening in state legislatures, including in Tennessee. And one big one is preemption laws. And preemption laws are state level enactments that say localities cannot enact uh, gun, any kind of laws based on this topic. And in firearms in particular, about 45 states out of the 50 have really broad preemption laws that say their localities, their local governments within those states cannot enact uh, gun laws. And Tennessee's is particularly broad. So it stops places like Nashville that might actually want to regulate guns more strictly than other parts of the state from enacting those actual regulations that would match the preferences of the voters of Nashville. So those are happening all across the country. The legal significance of those is that they probably probably stop more gun laws than does the Second Amendment itself. But we've also seen these other kind of legislative expansions, the repeal of a permit requirement to get a concealed, uh, to carry a concealed handgun, um, uh, stand your ground laws, as, um, as Ron was discussing, which Tennessee does, um, does indeed have, uh, these ways in which uh, some people who are carrying guns are privileged to carry guns in more and more places and in more and more ways. And on the other hand, as both Clemmie and Ron suggested, that coexists with a system of punishing gun crime really severely. So punishing those who are carrying without a license or punishing those um, who have prior convictions, punishing those um, who uh, may not be able to lawfully have a gun because uh, they had a prior conviction, but actually might need it for self-defense way more than other people in other parts of the state who don't face the constant uh, threats to their lives that some people do um, in the communities that Columbia and Ron are familiar with. Okay. All right, in the last two decades, gun-related injuries in Davidson County have increased by 200%. Uh, what, I'm asking, I'll start with you, Ron, again. You are out here, you're doing the work, you're representing the city. What do you think are some of the root causes of these deaths by firearms? Hmm, you know, I have this, this saying, when I think about root cause, I think we got to go all the way back to 1865. 
uh, and that is, you know, that was the day we were supposed to be free. But then following the freedom, we, we all these Drukanian, Drukanian laws got put in place. Uh, that's one thing. And, and the other root cause is, is the separation from having, you know, uh, when you think about a positive uh, influence in, the, in that, a person's life, a father, uh, you know, parents, the absence of a parent, all those different forms of trauma that a, a person experienced, poverty, lack of opportunities, all those things are things that contribute to the behaviors that we see. But here's the other thing I think that goes with that. You know, everything that we see are all learned behaviors. And in these learned behaviors, we don't put enough resources to try and help them unlearn it. I mean, almost to the point of like Clement said, 20 years ago, she told a mayor, look, y'all just give me $50,000 and give me a chance to show you that we can make some things happen in an area. And that's what you do when you do pilot programs. And that's kind of what we, we, we're we doing right now is to pilot some things to see how they will work. I think it, it's going to be incumbent upon us as, as city officials is to make sure that we invest in the people. Because the people see things, they know things, and then they, and they will stop things if we give them the resources that they need to do it. But if you're only going to continue to you know, do these knee-jerk reactions when things happen, that's why we're going to continue to have these same meetings. 20 years later, somebody else will be having these meetings, talking about y'all heard about Clement, Ron, and Sharon, and Professor having that conversation. They may be looking at this video. But nevertheless, if we really want to do something about it, we need to invest in the people. We need to train them up. We need to give them the things that they need. Some things you may see them do, we may not understand. And because you don't understand doesn't mean it's not right. Because it has worked, you know, in the area where they're doing the service and doing the things that they do, you go and survey that area, it's safe. You know, you take a five block radius in some of those areas where Clemmy and some of these groups that we deal with, they kind of patrol, so to speak, it's safe. And then, you know, uh, Stucky, Stucky uh, one of his research says that for every 100,000 people, if you have eight to 10 uh, nonprofits, you're talking about a 9% drop in uh, uh, community, I mean, uh, violence. And I mean, we're talking about intentional work, mm -hmm. though. I mean, because mm -hmm. people do a lot of different good things. But it, if it's intentional work, you'll see the shift and the change because somebody knows somebody Everybody know there's someone to know the perpetuators or the perpetrators of these crimes. That's why I think we're going to see the difference and the change. That's why I think we'll be able to change that 200%. All right. And Clemmy, talk a little bit more about your mother's group, because some people may not be familiar with that work and what that means. You talked about how that number is increasing. What does that number represent? It, it represents the death of uh, these mother's kids. Um, you know, I, I tell everybody when Ron say about 20 years ago, because my son was murdered in, in 2003. And I just don't understand why I'm still sitting here in 2023 talking about the high rate of gun violence. Plus, my nephew was murdered in 2014. Ron was there. My grandson was murdered in 2015. Ron was there. So when, when I say about mothers over murder, it's because when I went through this and I had nowhere to turn and nobody to turn to, uh, didn't have $100 an hour for therapy or any kind of help that I suppose they got mentally, uh, I, I realized that if, if I didn't get no help, then I know these other mothers have it. So I got one phone call that said, this lady gave me your number. She said, your son was murdered and she wanted to know if you could help me get through it. And I was like, no. I'll tell you too, but I don't even know how I'm getting through it. But, you know, she just started crying and stirring and venting. And it was like, wow. As I tell you what, ma'am, I tell you what, can, can you meet me? I'm going to give you my address. You meet me at my house. And she met me at my house. We started at my kitchen table just talking about it. And the next day that I know before we left, she said, uh, just say Miss Smith's son got killed two months ago and she ain't never had nobody to talk to. So would you talk to her the next time? And I was like, sure. And all of a sudden it just turned into something that I did not see coming. Mm -hmm. And this is where mothers over murder started for me. Cause when I got that mother, then she knew a mother, then she knew a mother. Then all of a sudden the 
the phone calls start coming about the high rate of the violence out here and I hit the streets because now I need to find out what's going on. So I called Ron and this was like 2010, 2009, mm-hmm. I called Ron, I was Ron, I gotta go out here and see where the game is at. So I gotta get street credibility first. Then I gotta find out what's going on is this retaliation, is this blood against the crypt, is what's going on. Well, when I got out there, I found out it was all the above. It was all about survival more than anything. Uh, and once I found out that, you know, these kids and right today, they really want to stop all of this. They really do. But they don't have anything. <laughs> and ain't nothing else I can do. I done did all I can do. And uh, I, I'm, I'm going to take 10 kids tomorrow to Birmingham. Oh, my God. I'm mm-hmm. going to take 10 girls and 10 boys to Birmingham tomorrow, 12 to 16 years old. And uh, and that's just to get them something to love on them. But they constantly comes to my home. I never get to live by myself again, don't look like. Uh, and they constantly trust me. They constantly come to me and Pastor Orr and turn in guns. They was coming to pa- Bishop Campbell at first. We still praying for him. So if we got the gravitativity to have the trust like we have out here in this community, then I don't understand why nobody that have the, the, the say so and the funds to trust us enough to move out of our way and let us show them. We can keep on going to this political stance that would get, be a leaf in the hell. We're going to go up here for the black voters matter. We're going to go up here for all of this. But once the hype is gone, doesn't nothing else happen. Doesn't nothing else show up. And so until we just put our foot down and just take a lead ourselves, uh, we'll be going through this conversation all over again. So my mother's over murder program is where I let them come with me every Wednesday. I mean, every Thursday on Zoom. And we meet every uh, su- fourth Sunday in person. If anybody ever want to just come and see what the effect of this is. And I got white. I got Hispanic. I got us. So I ain't no different color. I ain't no color. I, ain't no, I, ain't no, I don't discriminate, you know, because they hurt too. And I think what's happening is a couple of white, my white mothers, their sons are racial. So I think that's why they don't really get anywhere. Because see, they had all the publicity and all that around them until they showed that picture. Once they showed that picture and they saw that little Afro looking hair, they never came back to them. So that's what made them come to me. And we got to get past all of this. So let me tell y'all real quick where I'm going tonight. Sandy Hook is here. Y'all remember Sandy Hook? Okay, they are here. Now, Sandy Hook is coming to Nashville. So when Sandy Hook come to Nashville, here come the whole talk again about uh, the covenant shooting and the mass shooting. I was not invited, but those on here, I see 49 participants on here. Anybody on here that know me, know I will be at that event tonight. Uh, What you're not going to do is come in here with all of this mass shooting stuff and try to put my one-on-one shooting on the back burner. Because shooting is shooting, murder is murder, gun violence is gun violence, and we all need to bring all of this gun talk together. Thank you. And that brings to mind, because as I said, we are we were horrified with the Covenant shooting. However, as Clemmy has said, she's been fighting this fight for a long time, and Ron has been out here. In our monthly Continuing the Challenge email, uh, we wrote about how gun laws are applied differently and really gun tragedies are applied differently on the basis of, of race and within your work. Uh, Professor, have you seen any sort of data that talks about uh, the gun violence or gun, I guess, gun control that has a racial element to it? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the research I've seen bears out the personal experiences that Columbia's uh, been discussing. And um, I think it's important we talk about both gun rights and the gun regulation that both have been used um, in, 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 in multiple different ways, that both gun rights have been used to subordinate racial minorities in many ways throughout U.S. history up until the present, um, but also gun regulations have been used in that way. You often hear this refrain from strong Second Amendment advocates that gun control is racist, and certainly in the history of regulating guns throughout our country, as in the history of regulating everything else in the history of our country, laws have been put to racist ends and laws have been enacted for racist reasons. 
We also see the flip side, though, in that in many ways in U.S. history, guns and gun rights have been used to protect and defend racial minorities, that there is a strong uh, what's called a Black tradition of arms, as Professor Nicholas Johnson discusses, where guns were used to defend um, Black civil rights protesters during the civil rights movement and even before that uh, at the end of Reconstruction. So guns have been used for protection for racial minorities, but have also been used to harm and subordinate racial minorities. The same thing with gun regulations, that gun regulations have been used to disarm uh, Black members of society, but gun regulations have also been used to protect Black members of society. So uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, when there was a brief period in which Southern states had uh, Republican legislators who were um, the then the party that was in favor of protecting newly freed African Americans, um, Texas enacted a, one of the strictest handgun laws in the nation that said that no one could carry um, a, a handgun without a good reason to do so. And importantly, uh, the Texas legislature that passed that, all 12 Black members of the assembly voted in favor of the law. Both of the Black state senators voted in favor of the law. And I think this kind of, uh, of regulation uh, at least puts uh, or undermines the notion that all gun control throughout history has been racist. Uh, both gun laws and gun rights have been used uh, to protect and defend racial minorities, and then in other times uh, to subjugate and subordinate racial minorities. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ron, let me go back to, we you know, we're talking about the guns being stolen out of cars, etc. What happens to those guns once they're stolen out of the car? <laughs> well, let me tell you, uh, I, I was telling um chief green at one time i said you know what's what's so wild and clemmy could tell you this uh for those of us who've worked in this area if you gave me a hundred dollars and give me about an hour and a half i can probably go and get you an illegal gun off the streets like literally uh one that's one being connected to those who are in that space and then two you know some of these guns are, are brought into our community uh, specifically um and given to certain people for a whole bunch of different reasons. But um, what happens to those guns, those guns get caught up in a lot of the cases. Those guns take a lot of lives uh, unnecessarily. Those guns get used um, with you know retaliation. That's kind of one of the biggest core to a lot of things that we have going on is, is the uh, young people uh, and some of the crimes that we have, especially some of the violent crimes, most of them are tied to retaliation. And with that being you know, said, most people who are retaliating are retaliating because they think or believe something will happen to them or someone in their family. And a lot of time, it's not the person that they're going out. And then a lot of time, the, the wrong person ends up getting shot. That's what's happening to all those guns. For, most, for the most part, most of those guns. And they're, going, they're being stolen too and being sold. You know, they may exchange hands nine or 10 times. We have a lot of crimes that take place where, you know, a young guy meets somebody to sell a gun and then uh, a shootout breaks out. People lose their lives because bad deal gone bad, uh, a gun deal gone bad. Uh, usually that's what it is. They got some stolen guns and they trying to, you know, uh, get rid of them. Those are the things that we see quite a bit with those guns that get stolen. But we have a number of, right now, some just things we're doing like claiming We have drop boxes for those who know somebody or you got a kid you you know he don't have to know that you know you find a gun in your child's room that child don't have to know you take it and, and take it to those dropbox sites that we have we have a number of dropbox sites where once we get those gun no gun you know they will get scrapped to make absolutely sure if it's got something on it now we won't come back to that church or that place where we have those drop box boxes in we've had a number of guns that's been dropped off uh this year we've been had them out for almost a year now and it's growing. We are asking other churches and other municipalities to allow us to put those drop boxes there for people to just anonymously drop guns off. And then we're asking people, pleading with people, for those of you who do carry guns legally or illegally in your car, lock your car up, at least make it hard. What we found too is most of the cars where guns get stolen out of, their cars was open. Yeah. They was not locked. And they were sitting right in the front yard of some of the people's homes. So it's really important to remember you have your gun in the car, take it out, put it up, secure it or what have you. So we can hopefully get that part where it'd be less, but it hasn't. The numbers are going up. Okay. 
uh, Clemmy, these guns are being stolen out of cars. Uh, what happens to the guns? What have you seen? Well, it's basically what Ron said. Uh, they go sell them. I mean, some of them don't even want to use them for crying. They're going to sell them. They're going to get a pig pie. They're going to get their grandmama medicine. They're going to help pay light bills or the lights and get back on. They're going to pay rent. So, see, we need to start looking at survival here. You know, we can't keep on looking at all the violence and all the murder. And who is this right here? I know I ain't supposed to say nothing, but who is this Whitney talking about something Wednesday at the council members? something about special counsel, public health safety committee focusing on gun violence. Uh, these things right here ain't working. <laughs> they just ain't working. I mean, y'all can have all the meetings y'all want to keep having like this. All of this sound good and it look good. These kids are out here about survival. I'm going to say this one quick time. When the feds came in on me in 2010, it was because I had over 90 gang members of different sets that I was working with, that I had got off the street, that I was doing training with. I was showing them how to change car tires, how to change batteries, how to cook, how to clean, how to fill out reservoirs. In my kitchen, in a little bitty building we had, Ron know about it on Lishy. Mm -hmm. These kids, these teenagers, and these 12 or 14 year olds that's taking the, the 16 to 18 year old slacks now, they don't want to do this, y'all. They want something. So what I don't I don't want to keep talking about this same old stuff here. I want to talk about giving me some of these abandoned houses that's sitting around these communities, just got boarded up, waiting for somebody to come and build a tall and skinny and move us out again. I want to talk about giving me some of them, putting me in some of them, and let me show y'all what I can do to change these communities once I get them off the streets. The guns that they bring into us, guys, we got we received 60 guns one time and Ron was with us, and all we gave was, was a circus ticket. They <laughs> wanted to take their family to the circus and they bought us guns. So what do that tell y'all? We got to come up with other stuff that we know gonna work. And all of this going to these meetings, and I I, I, I give all of y'all the utmost respect. I don't have that knowledge, I have street knowledge. So if I listen to y'all all the time, y'all got to listen to me and my street knowledge. Something is not working. And how can y'all not say it won't work if won't nobody call my bluff? I saw somebody say, we need to ask uh, Martha Blackburn to come to one of my meetings. Please ask Martha Blackburn <laughs> to come to one of my meetings. I sit for a bus for the help her pick up, make her feel special. But anyway, y'all please, these guns are coming off the streets, out of the cars, killing our loved ones. They're going to kill y'all five years ago. Mm -hmm. I said this was going to get out of hand, and then it ain't going to be nothing I can do. And it got out of hand. I said five years ago, before I even had my heart transplant, school was going to get out of hand, and it's getting out of hand. So y'all, y'all got to come back to the streets. Y'all got to. You know, give us the give us the, the paperwork y'all got and the proposals y'all got, but y'all got to let us get back out here. Y'all have to. I'm telling you, it's the only solution to come and get our community and our life back. It's the only solution. And one thing I will talk about is there have been several proposals and they'll be discussed. In, uh, I believe they will be discussed in the legis special legislative session. Uh, there's a 72 hour waiting period. There used to be waiting periods before you, after you wanted to purchase a gun. Extreme risk protection orders, safe storage laws, a mandated reporting of lost stolen guns. Uh, I want to see if those proposals, uh, they seem to get momentum and there seems to be the majority of gun owners, including um, on a bipartisan level, that think that these are the potential solutions. Professor Charles, what do you think about these potential po potential legislative solutions? Yeah, I think um, based on the polling that I've seen that these proposals look like ones that have uh, pretty broad bipartisan support. 
Um, we, we see this at the national level as well as um, in states that are typically thought to be um, at the vanguard of expanding gun rights, that there are actually uh, the majority of citizens in those states who favor some of the restrictions um, on, uh, on either carrying or background checks um, for weapons. I think especially just want to highlight um, the extreme risk protection order laws, also known as red flag laws. Um, which are a, a relatively recent innovation. Uh, they, uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, these kind of laws allow law enforcement, sometimes family members or employers, to petition a court to temporarily remove somebody's firearms if there are sufficient behavioral indicators that that person is going to be an imminent threat to themselves or others. These are temporary. They require a court hearing. They require a court finding before someone's arms can be removed. And uh, the initial research on these laws shows that they could prevent gun suicides, that they can prevent um, or, or, or possibly prevent um, uh, mass shooting events. So those kind of laws um, can be extremely helpful. Um, waiting period laws, as you discussed, have shown that they can also calm down and uh, allow people a cooling off period uh, for those who might go and purchase a gun and use it to harm somebody or harm themselves in the immediate aftermath. I think one of the reasons that we see that even popular laws like these don't end up in legislative action a lot of times, both at the state level and at the national level, is that when we think about gun politics, there is a mismatch, or at least historically, there's been a mismatch in intensity among those who favor uh, really broad Second Amendment rights and those in favor of gun restrictions. Those in favor of broad Second Amendment protections tend to be really intense in their um, in the degree of their preferences for those kind of uh, policies. And they have often been single issue voters um, that uh, mm -hmm. that groups like the NRA and other gun rights um, organizations have successfully mobilized uh, to defeat any kind of gun regulations. Whereas traditionally, those who have been in favor of stricter gun regulations have not had as intense of a preference for those kind of policies that they'll report to pollsters that they're in favor of these policies, but they're not single issue voters on these kind of topics, that they can't be mobilized traditionally in the same way that those in favor of broad Second Amendment protections have been. We've seen in recent years with the rise uh, and more attention to um, national and local groups that uh, there is a, uh, a bridging of the gap and especially in the new generation um, of the young voters that there is a bridging of this intensity gap but historically this has been one of the explanations for why even though the majority of people favor stricter gun regulations many states are moving in the opposite direction. Okay, let's go to you, Ron, because Ron, you and I have worked on a on a group that are seeking toward a, a cure violence model and some things of that nature. And the reason that we are doing this work is we believe that we need some alternatives to more of the traditional legislative efforts to uh, work toward ending violence in the communities. Can you talk some about that work, including the work you're doing with the village and those? Because the legislative things are easy to turn to and states move in this direction. There are some things that make a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, if you're just reading them, they make sense. And I think that really they're a minimum standard as opposed to a maximum effort. I agree with you, Professor. And so I really want to see what we are doing in addition to that in Nashville at grassroots level. Well, I, I tell you, thanks. That's a great question, a great uh, mm -hmm. statement. So the cure violence model is one that's been used in different parts of the country. Chicago is kind of like the... Um, the model where it takes place, Queer Violence Global has been leading the charge with that. And the Queer Violence model, what we are, are doing is we, we're taking the kind of non-traditional way of getting people who are engaged in that area that may have been a gang member, that may have a violent past or what have you, and giving them an opportunity to disrupt or interrupt violence. That's kind of what the Queer Violence model looks like. And so we have deployed it also from the health department perspective because violence being a health epidemic, uh, we know that, but we also uh, have made absolutely sure that don't get tied all the way to mental health because what we found is, is that it's not always mental health is causing people to do some of these violent things. Uh, so in the cure violence model, it's building a team of people who can disrupt that violence in its original state. Say, for instance, uh, for example, uh, someone is about to shoot someone, but they have respect for a uh, or they have respect for 
you know, a person that that got pretty good uh, uh, pedigree in that community, and they can walk right up in the midst of that that uh, situation there and calm it down. And right there, no one gets shot. Everybody gets to go home. Now, it, it is what we call stopping the initial transmission of violence. That's a cure violence way of thinking. But the thing about that is you pay those people, you train them the, you know, the way that you would like for them to do, but they still get to use their street way of living and what have you, because they are there. They live there in that community and you're able to resource them in their community. Also, the other way, is what we're doing with the village is we have groups and organizations that actually work and live in those communities. But like we, you know, we, we you know, it's almost like sometimes beating a dead horse, you know, you gotta give the people what they need to do what they do. If we don't ever try it, we can't ever say that it didn't work. And it seems like what has been happening is people have been saying it didn't or it won't work. Well, I think we've tried so many other things. Why not try? the things that is non-conventional, non that's different from the way we've done it in the past. And that would be doing it in the way, as Clemmy has said, and I have to use her because I've seen the work, I've seen what she do, I have no her capability. And all I would, I would just lobby for and say, as an official, I'm down with making absolutely sure for someone like a Clemmy, let's Let's find a way to, to be able to give her $150,000 or what have you and say, go for it. And here's the, some time that we'd like for you to kind of, and then we create a database because, you know, that is what really continues to drive these things. We create a database of just an area, geographical area, five or six blocks, see if we can make this block safer. And then we do that collectively around the board. That's what we've been trying to do with the village. What I do is I get different reports. Like, for instance, I'll give you an example over the last week, uh, we've had, uh, in the last seven days, I've had 66 assaults, one homicide, uh, and five non-lethal shootings uh, in the last seven days, just right here in Nashville. So what I do is I map this out in the area that it has taken place. I put in those zip codes where it's taking place. I see what members of the village that we have in that area and it's almost like deployment, you know, like in the military, we know we ain't doing something. You put a surge and you see that that surge change what's happening over there. Well, it's similar to that. We put a surge of resources, people who live in that community. We give them resources to be able to do what they're doing. They are able to go in there and show you that they can change their community. Uh, and what, one of the things I'll say about that is, we have not been able to police enough and police our way out of it. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need our police, but we need to invest in our citizens a lot more than we have in order to change some of the violence that we see in our communities. All right. And Clemmy, and I'm going to get back to you because I do want you to expound on this, uh, Professor Charles, about the uh, RAN, RAN uh, data. But Clemmy, let me ask you this. Uh, there are a lot of these uh, proposals and I've heard you. Now I understand that you do uh, appreciate these efforts, but this doesn't seem to address the teenager that has no money, no hope, no skills, no one supporting them. They steal a gun out of a car because they're trying to get some money. That gun is used to perpetuate violence in the community. I'm looking at that kind of solution. That's more of what the village is doing. We're trying to work toward those uh, community grassroots efforts because if you see violence in one community, like Ron is saying, that violence will ultimately get to other communities and we have seen that occur. So tell me something, Clemmie. Well, I mean, I, I have texts on my phone every day with 15, 16 year olds asking me, can I help them make some kind of money? Do I got anything they could do to make a dollar? And I just cash out some $20, $25 because I don't. So what I do now, you know, we went and bought a pickup truck and a trailer, me and my husband. So now we can go and with, with they can go with him to go pick up some of these bricks and rocks and move people furniture out of the house and make some up for half of a day. But after that, it's over with what? So this, this, these policies, they are needed. They do help. 
but they don't help right now. They don't help in our area. They don't help in our community. And half the people that's out here with the stolen guns and, and the cars getting broken into, they don't even realize where they have moved to, number one, because they wouldn't leave them in there. Number two, these kids are needing a right now fix. And they only right now fix is somebody to be here that they have hope for that they know they can come to Miss Clement house and she's going to put them to work. I got three teenage girls. I got one girl up in me at eight o'clock. I mean, at, uh, uh, this evening, I met her, her parents yesterday. Her mother, the mother and the father called me. Uh, she's an 18 year old girl, beautiful girl, smart, but she's all over the place. So I'm going to meet, I'm going to meet them after lunch. I got two 16 year old girls that I'm taking with me, Ron, to meet Cindy and we're going to pay them to, Help us get some of this paperwork together. We got stacked all up on the file cabinet. So it's, it's, it's people like us that got to have some kind of funds in a pocket over here that we can come and those 10 kids I'm finna take to, to uh, Birmingham tomorrow and those 10 girls, 10 girls, 10 boys, those are 20 kids that have not dropped out of school, have not been to juvenile, have not picked up a gun. So when I get through with them, then what? I mean, I'm, go I'm going to get 10 more, but then what? You don't have nothing afterwards. And remember this, y'all. Everybody got all these good resources, these good programs and all that, but they close at 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. After that, these kids are out here all day, all night long with nothing else to do until 8 o'clock come back around when school or the center or the library or whatever open. You got to put something in the middle. And that's where I come in at the kids with the guns, they are doing the guns because they see enough video movies and they see enough on their block that this is how I'm supposed to do it and this is the only way I'm going to survive. And I know for a fact it's a few of us can change that. Okay, I get that. So that's at that level. Now, we talked earlier about this special session and if Tennessee lawmakers make the argument that these changes won't make a difference and that, you know, there's some data out there, but the data gets confusion, confusing. Professor Charles, give us a quick and dirty. Where is this data showing us? What are these studies showing us about the effectiveness of these just straight up legislative changes? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to give a quick and dirty because there is a ton of disagreement, um, even among mm -hmm. economists uh, who study these um, and know numbers much better than I do about which um, exact measures are going to reduce gun injuries, gun deaths, um, gun threats, gun suicide. Um, in general, if you look at the, I put a, a link in the chat to the RAND Corporation studies. The RAND Corporation is a nonpartisan organization, and it's one of the ones that I rely on because it's nonpartisan and it compiles the research on a number of different gun policies and says which ones have been shown to be effective and which ones there is either insufficient evidence or evidence that shows they haven't been um, as effective uh, on things like safe storage laws or child access prevention laws. Those have the highest rating of effectiveness in RAND's um, studies. So those kind of laws have shown um, pretty broad, uh, pretty broad effects on reducing gun injuries um, and, and, and um, another kind of gun harm. Um, things like background checks have shown um, some, some moderate support in the empirical literature. Um, and stand your ground laws, which has come up in our time, have, have shown to increase um, violent crime, and increase um, uh, gun injuries and deaths. And so that's also received the highest rating in RAND's, um, in Rand's uh, most recent report on the empirical effectiveness of laws. Um, but it's just if for those who are more interested, there's about 16 or maybe more um, different kind of gun policies that are rated in RAND's most recent report that shows where the evidence lies on those kind of policies. Okay, okay. Let's go to this. I always end up with people giving their last uh, shot at this. If they had a magic wand, and I'll go back to you first, Professor, then to Ron and to Clinton. If you had a magic wand that you could wave to somehow better our society on the issue of Second Amendment guns or whatever, what would that magic wand enable you to do? Wow, I, I was not prepared for this question. I know. Um, <laughs> well, you can handle it. Uh, well, you know, even though I'm I'm purely legal and I'm purely constitutional, um, 
I actually think Clem is exactly right that the most devastating effects of gun violence happen in the places where a lot of these laws aren't going to do um, what uh, we want them to do immediately. And that if we're going to get at the root causes, there needs to be a ton more funding for groups like Clemmy's group and for um, housing and infrastructure and education and healthcare, the kinds of things that make a thriving society. Um, so even though that's not directly related to gun violence, that most gun violence is a response to these kind of material conditions, um, and especially in places that have been historically neglected. Great. Okay. Ron Johnson. Wow. I could just take that magic wand and say ditto. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm telling you, because, I mean, really and truly, I always think about some of the things that I know about what happened in the war over in Afghanistan and how uh, our military um, having to travel through uh, village to village uh, had, you know, suitcases full of money where they, to negotiate coming through their village, they needed to be able to give these village leaders money. And that was for the village leaders to kind of you know, call the dogs off, like, no, no, no. And then also, it's to get that village leader to get along with that next village that's next door. Historically, they haven't gotten along. So it's like this. Historically, in some of our neighborhoods, from street to street, people hadn't gotten along because I'm from 21st Street and you from 5th Street, so we don't get along. In order for you to come through here, you need to drop something off. In other words, drop something off, meaning uh, if, if I had my magic wand, I would really like to have uh, a few million, a million, a few million dollars to be able to kind of go out there and discreetly, I mean, indiscreetly, just kind of give it to those people and say, show me what you can do. I believe in you. But we have some accountability that goes along with that because I don't want them to go out there and buy a brand new car and be like, yeah. Uh, but what I would like to see is it's kind of like what, 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 Clemmy, you know, we got to lean on her because. We've been at this thing for a very long time. I ain't just heard what she do. I've, I've seen it with my own eyes, and I've also been one who have worked in that area, and I'm just fortunate now to be appointed to this space. I just wish with my magic wand that if I had the money, I would be like this. In those areas where the violence is happening the most, you will be able to see those changes. And then we'd say, okay, let's go and look at some of these laws and say, what law do we need to change? Because we just did it because we was able to have resources, which would be money. That's for the most part what we find most people need is money. That's what I would like to do with my magic wand. Okay, Clemmy, bring the magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I definitely would love to have a new car. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the magic wand would just be two things with me right now. It would be the $100,000 that I think I need and I deserve that I can show people what I've been talking about all these years. And the reason I just say 100,000, because if 500 come, 1.2 million come or whatever it'll come, but 100,000 would just show me, show me what I've been talking about all along and I'll be able to show somebody else. The second thing is Linda Fair McFadden is on here talking about uh, uh, homeboy industry. Uh, well, I, me and Ron has already been talking about that. I've asked Ron to ask the mayor office to take me there because I want to follow their model because I've been following them for years. So I thank you for throwing that in there, though, Linda. Yeah. But those are my two things. I do want to go meet uh, Mr. Greg oh. Ball. I think he's awesome. Uh, he did. He started out cooking like I started out cooking with the games. He just took off. And if his model worked, I think we need to go find out what he's doing that we can bring to Tennessee. And Paul the, the G is a real good friend of mine. Yeah, okay. so that's it. I get to the mayor. I let him know before he leave out of there. We need a trip. <laughs> uh, but yeah. other than that, give me my hundred. Give me a, a chance to get a hundred thousand dollar grant. Ron them has been working with me with a CPA to see whatever I need or don't need, can need, and make it happen. Yeah. Well, I thank so much this panel. I like all of our panels in our short period of time, we can only uh, really look at the surface. But I think we've given you enough to at least think about. I think all of you have looked at, you know, I think at the end of the day, we're going to have to make sure that people have their basic needs met. And this is just my viewpoint, and this follows a YW mission in order for us to solve this. I do think legislative change is better than nothing. And, you know, I think that some of those things do help us in certain, certain limited basis. But I also thank all of you for the work that you're doing, uh, Professor Charles. 
Fabulous to have you. Keep on researching this because at the heart, when we go to these legislative sessions and we have to answer these questions, that data and that information, that perspective is helpful to us. Thank you, Ron, for all you do to our community and all you're out here doing on the day-to-day. -day. You know, you're definitely a hero of our community. We thank you. And Clemmy, you're out here day-to-day. -day. And really, I mean, people don't really know Clemmy like I know her, but she actually risked her own security and safety to keep others safe and to sure up those mothers. So thank you so much. And thank you for those who, who are part of this. And this is what the YW does is part of our mission. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you for having me.